Hey everybody, Joey here, and as you probably now know, uh, b and has sent me the Fujinon 18-55 Cinema Zoom Lens to test out. Now, I've had my eye on this lens for quite a while. I'm super excited to try it out. I've used cinema lenses in the past, but they're normally very expensive. It's something you rent. This lens came out as kind of an affordable option for people if they want to um, you know, invest in some glass, and specifically a Cinema Zoom lens like this. Before we break it in, let's just quickly go over what this lens is, what kind of body it is here. Um, it's very typical of Cinema Zooms. You have your, your three ring system, you get your, your iris up front, your zoom right in the middle, and your focus here at the very end. Uh, this lens in particular opens up at T2.9, and then it'll actually stay that range for the entire zoom. Uh, right now, Fujinon is only offering this lens in like a Sony E-mount. Uh, which is fine because we use the Sony FS5. And normally we use all Canon glass for those cameras and we just uh, adapt those over with like a Metabones adapter which allows us to use our Canon glass on our Sony FS5. Um, this lens will fit here natively. If you have an FS7, this lens will fit there as well. It's actually kind of a lens perfectly made for the FS7 or the FS5 in my opinion. Um, but we haven't tested it out yet. Uh, it came at just the perfect time because today is Saturday and I'm about to drive down to Pasadena to meet Norman Frank to cover Monster Palooza. So we'll really break this lens in there. It's just gonna, just gonna dive right into it, shoot a bunch of interviews, shoot coverage, uh, and then we'll come back and talk more about what a cinema lens is compared to like a still lens, and like why I'm excited about this, and um, why this lens might be good for you if you are trying to do certain things. So back when I started doing this in the early 2000s, um, mini DV camcorders were the big thing. Mini DV high definition camcorders. Now uh, a lot of people, including myself, kind of cut their teeth on those cameras and a lot of those cameras didn't have the option for interchangeable lenses. A lot of the lenses were built right onto the camera uh, you know, by the manufacturer and those lenses all had cinema lens like characteristics to them because they were, they were specifically designed for the moving image. Uh, and that's where the big difference between still lenses and cinema lenses kind of come in. Now, as we get to like the mid 2000s and DSLRs started becoming a, a big you know, power hitter in the video world, people started using those cameras a lot and then just utilizing their still lenses for, for those jobs, for the, those video jobs. Now, um, those lenses are designed for one image, the still image. And because of that, they're constructed slightly differently and, uh, and they just operate a, a little differently. And that's kind of what I want to focus this video on. This, this Fujinon is a very affordable cinema lens, and it kind of has a lot of those, um, a lot of those aspects that the really expensive cinema lenses have. So this, this is a great lens that kind of pit against, um, you know, not I'm not trying to pit against other lenses as far as image quality, but like just comparing it to what a still lens allows you to do and what a, a cinema lens allows you to do, and where those differences are, and kind of how those lenses operate differently. So uh, we'll get much more into detail on that when we uh, get back from Monster Palooza with all the test footage. All right, so not only did I get a chance to take this on Monster Palooza on all the interview shoots there, but I also got to take it through a full episode of Bits of Adams with Sean and Jeremy, and then I got to take it for a real test drive through Adams' one day build videos. So before we get into the image and functionality of this lens, I'm going to need to go over a few terms that I'm gonna throw out. Uh, the first is focus breathing. If you look at this frame here, uh, as I rack the focus back and forth, you can see that there's some distortion in the images in the frame. Uh, that's focus breathing. Now most still lenses will have that. That's because it doesn't really matter for still cameras. You're focusing on an image, you're snapping a shot, you're focusing on something else, you're snapping another shot. Cinema lenses tend to not have that. I, there's actually a lot of cinema lenses that do have this feature, uh, but um, there are a lot that don't. And that's because it's a you know, matter of taste. Some people do not want their image distorting when they do rack focusing. Uh, this Fujinon does not have any focus breathing whatsoever. So as I rack this camera back and forth and focus, the entire image kind of stays the same. There's no distortion there. And it's actually a very clean effect that I, I like, I prefer. Now the next is parfocal versus verifocal lenses. Now most still cameras are verifocal. Now verifocal is a change in your focus as you zoom in and out of an image. So uh, when you zoom in on something, you focus on it and you zoom out, the focus will be completely different. That focal point will not be that same point anymore. It'll be different. Uh, and again, when you think about still lenses, it's not that big of a deal because you know, you're zooming in, you're focusing on something, taking a picture, zooming out, focusing on something, taking a picture. And most of the time uh, in still photography, that's assisted by autofocus. 
Now when shooting video, that can be a little trickier with a, a varifocal lens, because oftentimes you'll want to punch in on your subject, you know, change shots, punch out, and you're always kind of chasing your focus. And there's a lot of times where you actually see this in video. You'll see you know, a zoom in and then like a kind of a focus change. And if you're anything like me, you're always gonna crank the focus ring in the wrong direction, making it everything worse, and then chasing back the other way to grab focus. That's where parfocal lenses come in. Now, a lot of cinema lenses, a lot of, a lot of cinema zoom lenses have this uh, built in, and parfocal is, the, is actually just maintaining the focal point no matter what your zoom is, no matter what, what the lens distance is at. So uh, oftentimes when I was like shooting ENG style stuff, you'll punch in all the way, you know, focus, grab, you know, grab focus right in the eyeball, zoom out, and you'll still have that same focus point. Now for a lot of the interviews, like I shoot, um, I shoot this way where I, I'll punch in for emphasis or I'll kind of adjust shots, punch out, punch in, and having, having your focus kind of maintain consistency is, a huge help for that kind of stuff. You make do with a still lens when you're when you're chasing focus around, but you know it's not ideal. Uh, I love parfocal lenses, um, but you know it comes at a price from very focal still lenses. So then there's focus throw. Now focus throw is how much you have to turn the focus ring in relation to how far the focal distance is traveling. Uh, if that makes sense. So on cinema lenses, you have a very long focus throw. So I can kind of turn the, turn the ring like four or five, six inches and my focal distance will change from here to like six feet ahead of me. With the still lenses, um, most still lenses has a very, have a very small focus throw. So a half inch turn of this thing and my, distance, my focal point can shoot you know, 12 feet away. Now, if you think about why that is, why, the, why there's a difference there, you kind of have to think about films and, and you know, the camera is, and films are often always moving. They're on dolly tracks, jibs, whatever. Um, and oftentimes they'll have a focus puller alongside the camera operator who's, who's kind of you know, cranking something that'll you know, turn the focus ring to, get, to keep everything in focus. Now, if you think about like a dolly track, if this camera is running on a dolly track and the focus puller you know, has a lot of leeway because it's such a big focus throw, he can kind of you know, ride the focus and keep everything in focus as that camera's moving. If this was all done on like a still lens, the focus puller, uh, he has to be very careful because he only can only move the focus very tiny bit to keep everything in focus. You know, one half, half centimeter, half inch turn uh, the wrong direction and that focus can just shoot out of the way and um, you know, that would be the end of the take. So before we wrap this up, I do wanna just go over real quickly uh, a few more minor differences between the constructions of these two lenses, the still lenses and the cinema lenses, because you know, as you notice, the bodies are quite different and I think that is worth noting. So here's a Fujinon 18 to 55 cinema lens, and here's a Canon uh, 17 to 40 still lens. Now, most cinema lenses are built a little more ruggedly. They can handle the natural elements a little bit better than the still lenses can. Uh, they're not gonna warp as much with like heat, and they're typically a little more like moisture resistant. Cinema lenses are often a little easier to get professional maintenance on, repairs on. Um, you know, most rental houses that, that house Real expensive lenses kind of take care of their own. Uh, yeah, as you know, time goes on and the elements start altering inside of the lens, um, you know, they can be repaired kind of back to new. Most still lenses are not quite built with the intention of being repaired. Um, they're often kind of considered replaceable. Like the cost of the repair will sometimes be more than the cost of the lens. Uh, and then there's also T-stops and F-stops. So I'll do my best to explain this. Um, you've probably heard F-stops before. That's the number that corresponds with like the aperture pupil that lets light into the sensor. So an F-stop is essentially like a measurement and it's calculated based on the construction of the specific lens with the iris opening to measure light throughput. Now what happens though is by the time that light actually hits the sensor of the camera, that f-stop number might be slightly different, might be slightly higher, um, because you know, there's a little bit of light loss by the time it gets to the sensor. And that's because the f-stop is measured based off the construction of the lens and not the light that's actually being pushed out of the lens onto the sensor. It's not a huge change, but it's a little bit unreliable in its lack of precision. A t-stop accounts for this. Um, when a camera has a t-stop number on it, that means that that lens has been factory tested to make sure that the number you're reading on that light throughput is so accurate that you can change up you know, manufacturers or lens types and you know, match that T number and you should have an identical read. That's not gonna be necessary for everyone, but in situations where like data needs to be collected from cameras for you know, long shoots or there's pickups, you know, or there's like multiple camera shoots, or you need to make sure that your VFX shots have the correct data that the camera and the lenses provide, um, that's where precision starts becoming important. That's where T-stops start becoming important. So now you'll also notice that this lens has a little like macro tab here. Now that's to actually change your minimum focal point. 
So the ca this camera has like a 0.85 minimum focal distance. Uh, and if you want to get anywhere closer to there, you actually use this macro tab. You click it up and then you kind of ride this wheel and that actually changes the back focus of this lens uh, to allow you to get much closer. You get to like 0.35 or something. Uh, so using that, you can get your macro shots and bring that lens real close into the subject. And then as you come out, you just spin this wheel back and then it clicks into when it's at its kind of default back focus position. Uh, really strange thing to use. I've never used that before. I know it's um, popular on a lot of like new style ENG lenses, but I've, I've never used it before. It took a little time to get used to, but um, you know, it worked out. And I was able to, to grab things, um, kind of change the, the focus dynamics of this camera, which was a, a neat thing to do. Uh, so the next shoot, I took this up to San Francisco on the Bits of Adam shoot. Now that's a, a show that we do with Sean and Jeremy. We had like indoor shoots, we had outdoor shoots, and we had studio shoots. This thing, this is where this thing really just, it looked rock solid, crystal clear throughout all this stuff. I mean, this is where I like, I really fell in love with the image. Now I'm not gonna do huge like image comparisons with this lens. There are plenty of resources out there, people who are just taking these lenses and kind of uh, just tons of lenses, all cinema lenses, all still lenses, and just doing rigorous tests, shooting charts, um, you know, shooting light tests, seeing how they flare up. It requires a lot of precision. I'm, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna just you know, say for sand, I think it looks great. Compared to our other lenses, I think this thing looks real sharp and just the color renditions just look fantastic. And uh, it, you know, it's just got a very nice look to it. So lastly, there was the Adam Savage one day build shoot that I brought this lens along to. And that was the one I was probably the most nervous about. Uh, typically with that shoot, I like to use the 24 to 105 lens for a few reasons. Um, one being that Adam works very fast in his shop and he'll typically spend like 10 seconds on a machine. And in that 10 seconds, I can grab three different focal lengths and then cut those together as if they're like three different cameras. Uh, you know, kind of upping the production value of that shoot by imitating a multi-camera shoot. The second is I like to maintain a good amount of distance away from Adam. Uh, we're in a working shop and there's power tools and machines and to kind of keep him um, with enough freedom to do, to be in his most natural environment and also to kind of, just kind of be safe, be safe for both of us. I like to stay, you know, a good bit, a good bit away from him and using those longer lenses, I can kind of push in real tight on stuff while being like six to eight feet away and you know, everyone's safe, everyone's happy. With this lens, that's, uh, you know, 55 is the, the furthest I can go and that's a little short, but I, I may do. Uh, I used it, I used the 18, I basically just went through 18 to 55. I didn't really hang around the mid, um, the mid of that range too much. I gotta zoom in a little bit here and there, but it was mostly extreme. So I go 18 to 55. So my shooting style changed a little bit. I would, I would do, you know, do two angles instead of three. And I did have to get a little bit closer to him which was, you know, a little nerve wracking when you got you know, band saws and table saws. You know, it wasn't a huge problem. And this lens is, is massive. The 24 to 105 is about this big. And I mean, these, these lenses look much different, uh, but this lens is actually pretty light for what it is. And it was like a seven hour day shoot. And I was able to hold this thing on the FS5 pretty much all day without any problem. I was able to just, you know, I was fine by the end of that shoot. I thought I'd, my wrist was gonna break off because of the, the weight of this thing, but no, no, it's not bad. Um, you know, very, very easy to do handheld all day long with the right rig. So for the one day builds, I'll probably continue to use a 24 to 105 lens. There is a, a versatility to that lens that I think outweighs the shortcomings of not having those cinema lens features. Um, and that's fine. This is totally a kind of a right, you know, right gear for the right job situation. Uh, but this lens, if I was to be gearing up like a whole new team for production, uh, for like event shooting and, and interviews and stuff. I would you know pair this lens up with an FS5, uh, you know, with like a shape handle, and there you got like a nice ENG rig uh, that's perfect, I think, for those kind of shoots. Um, you know, you're spending under you know 10,000 for that entire package. Uh, the Fujinon you know, is close to 4,000. You know, 5,000 with another camera, and that's you know I think you got yourself a nice workhorse there. So. That is a lot of information. Um, hopefully it cleared up some stuff on the still versus cinema lens territory. Uh, thank you to B&H for sending this guy. I'm really bummed I gotta send it back. Uh, I've had a lot of fun playing with it. Hopefully I'll play with some more you know, higher end cinema lenses in the future on some of these tested shoots. Um, shoot me any questions if you got them in the comments below. I'll do my best to answer. Thank you guys for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye.